John Wesley was crossing the Atlantic, the great preacher, writer, uh, when strong winds came up against their ship. He was reading in his cabin when he heard all this confusion up on the deck and he learned that, uh, you know, the winds were driving the ship off course. So he got down on his knees and began to pray and his uh, colleague, Adam Clark, uh, was, uh, was, was there and heard him, and so he actually wrote down what he prayed. His prayer went something like this, O oh God, creator of the heavens and the earth, you rule over everything. You rule over the winds and the waves. Stop these winds so that we can safely make it to our destination. Then he got off his knees and got back in his chair, started reading again, and Adam Clark went up on the, up top and uh, the winds stopped totally. Wesley never said anything about the amazing answer to prayer. He so believed that God heard his prayer and would answer. Wow, wouldn't you like to pray like that? Where you know when you pray God hears you? And will answer your prayer. A well-known business axiom says if you want to know something, ask, ask an expert. So if you want to know about basketball, you ask LeBron James. If it's golf you want to learn about, you ask Dustin Johnson. If it's tennis, you, you go to Roger Federer. If you want to learn about Facebook, you go to Mark Zuckerberg. So it makes sense, if you want to learn about prayer, you go to the expert, Jesus Christ. No one in history believed more in the power of prayer than Jesus Christ. Among the snapshots we see of his life, we see prayer played an extremely important part. After one a very busy day of teaching in the synagogue, he exercised a demon from a man and healed many people, we read. Jesus got up very early in the morning while it was still dark and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Before he chose the 12 disciples, we read, he prayed through the night. After his amazing feat of feeding 5,000 men plus wives and children with only two fish and five uh, loaves of bread, small loaves of bread, we read, Jesus went into the hills to pray. Before his crucifixion, we're told, he spent most of the night in prayer. When he found his disciples sleeping in the garden in Gethsemane that same night, he asked, could you not pray with me one hour? His first and last words on the cross were prayers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His final words before he ascended back to heaven were a prayer of blessing. Prayer pervaded Christ's life. He prayed in public and he prayed in private. He prayed about ordinary things and he prayed in crises. He prayed before big decisions and after momentous victories. The life of Christ on earth was prayer. Why should we pray? Because Christ prayed. What was it about prayer that Jesus knew that we need to learn? The disciples didn't fail to notice that Jesus got up early in the morning to pray and he prayed long into the night, many nights. They noticed the fruit of prayer in his life. When things were just wild and people were all around him, following him, coming to him, he didn't seem to be in a state of panic. So they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. We want what you have. We want to get it like you do. You can learn to pray like Jesus. 
Jesus responded by teaching them what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew 6, 9 to 15, if you want to follow along in the Bibles we have under the seats. It's on page 970. Now, most of us have said the Lord's Prayer. We said it with stew. It's a beautiful prayer, and saying that prayer at any point during the week is a, a good thing to do. But I think the more important thing to understand about it is in the prayer, Jesus tells us what to pray for and how to pray. It's not just reciting it that's so important. It's understanding what he teaches us about prayer. Jesus shows us three important things in this prayer. Uh, three secrets, if you will, to prayer. First, start your prayers by praising God. Jesus begins, Our Father in heaven. All great prayers in the Bible begin with praise. Praise. Uh, prayer, praise reminds us uh, who we're talking to, the God we're addressing. Our Father tells us that we speak to a God who loves us like a father. Just like any human father wants his children to come to him and bring their needs to him, God is a father to us. He wants us to bring our needs. In heaven tells us that he's not just any father. He's the father who lives in heaven. He created this beautiful uh, blue heavens that we see all, all week long in the sun and the sunsets and the sunrises. The, the beautiful mountains we've seen this week. Our father in heaven putting it together tells us everything we need to know. We have a God who loves us like a father and he lives in heaven. He has all power. Then Jesus continues with a second secret. Pray for God's honor, God's kingdom, and God's will. He continues his prayer. Read this with me. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, if you want your prayers to go right, if you want them to be powerful, begin with requests that increase God's honor, God's kingdom, and God's will. If we want to pray like Jesus prayed, we'll start our prayers with petitions that further God's work. God's concerns become utmost in our minds. One of the great lessons of the Lord's Prayer is that we come to God with prayer and it's, it's not to be self-centered, but to be God-centered. Now, we all want to give the impression that uh, we're God-centered. You know, our life's all about Christ. Uh, but the truth is that we are all self-centered. I certainly know I am. Most of our concerns are about ourselves. It's like the guy who is applying for life insurance and the, the agent asked him, um, okay, tell me about your, your father. He says, well, he died. How old was he when he died? 43. Well, what did he die of? A heart attack. Okay, tell me about your mother. Well, she's dead too. Well, how old was she when she died? 41. What did she die of? Cancer. The guy pushed aside the application. He says, man, you're a terrible risk. It's going to be really hard for you to get life insurance. So he went to another agent. Next agent asked him kind of the same questions. He says, well, all right, what about your, your dad? Well, he died. How old was he when he died? 93. What did he die of? Uh, he died in a mountain climbing accident. <laughs> well, how about your mother? Well, she, she died too. How old was she when she died? 91. Well, how did she die? Giving birth to my little sister. <laughs> Most of our prayers are self-centered. We often begin our prayers with our needs, our hurts, our desires. Sometimes that's not only where we begin, it's where we end. We become so absorbed with our own concerns, we never get around to praying for God's concerns. 
Some time back, I was at a tennis tournament with our then uh, 12-year-old Cam. She had won the first four rounds of the tournament pretty easily, but in the final, she was going to play a girl that's pretty good. But she wasn't too worried because she'd never lost to this girl. I showed up at the, the match a little late, and uh, to my surprise, Cam was down uh, love 0-1. One, one. And uh, then Cam won her serve pretty easily. It was 1-1, one, one, but then she lost to the other girl on, on her serve again. So it was 1-2. Then again, Cam won her serve pretty, pretty easily, 2-2. Two, two. But then she lost it to this other girl on, on her serve again, so she was down 2-3. I thought, well, you know, at least she'll win her serve, so we'll be fine. But then Cam, you know, made a couple mistakes. She got down love 30. Now, tennis is a little strange the way they, they score it, but uh, there's only, it takes four points to win a game, and so she, she was down, she'd lost the first two points. Um, well, then Cam won the next point, and uh, so it was 15-30, but then, but then she lost another point. So now it's 15-40. She's only one point from losing the game. This is what's called, you know, playing with fire. You're in, you're in a danger zone. Well, then Cam won the next point, hit, hit really well. Uh, then the, the, the next point was like a 20-stroke rally, and Cam was playing it really safe because she was, you know, on the edge. And then she dropped one in the net. So now she's down 2-4. Not the way you want to start a match against somebody you expect to, to beat pretty handily. Well, the, the girls traded punches over the next four games, but Cam lost the set, 4-6. Well, the second set, came, uh, Cam came out with a whole new attitude. and was hitting stronger, hitting more relaxed, and really putting in her, her serve strong. She won easily. So that was set apiece. In some tournaments, when uh, it's getting late uh, on the final day, the director ha has discretion, and he decided to make the, the tiebreaker a 10-point a tiebreaker. In other words, first person to win 10 points by two points wins the match. These are what you call, nobody wants to be in one of those. Anything can happen in a tiebreaker. And uh, so they're, they're, they're dangerous. But if you have to play one, the strategy you want to do is to jump out early and get ahead. Well, Cam chose not to do it that way. So as I'm sitting there watching, it's so tight and going along, I'm saying, God, please help her. And as it got tighter and closer to 10 points, I'm praying, God, please help her. Did you know that if you put in more vowels, God's more likely, <laughs> please. <laughs> All of a sudden, it you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, God, this will be a disaster if she loses this. And all of a sudden it struck me what I was doing. A disaster? A disaster for whom? For me? For Cam? For what? I mean, in God's concerns, uh, he's, he's concerned about our character and our responses to things that happen in life. A loss can be as valuable as a win. I wasn't praying about God's concerns. I was praying about my concerns. Maybe Cam's. Is that the way you pray? All about me? God, help me? When Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, he told them to start by praying. Read this with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The first concerns in our prayers ought to be his honor, his kingdom, and his will. I was praying about my name, my kingdom, and my will. In case you're interested, Cam won the tiebreaker, won the tournament, but it wasn't due to my prayers. Have you ever found yourself praying uh, the way I did? You pray for a job, you pray for a promotion, to win an athletic game, to do well on a test, or for nice weather for an outing. It's all about you. That's directly opposite what Jesus teaches us here, that we're supposed to begin with concerns about him and his kingdom, his honor. If our prayers are all about us, we turn God kind of into a, a cosmic errand boy. 
The first three requests in the Lord's Prayer are not about us, but for God's honor to be increased, God's kingdom to be expanded, God's will to be done. In our culture, we're taught to be constantly concerned about ourselves. But a Christ followers, top concerns are to be God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. So what increases God's kingdom, brings honor to his name? God's will is that his lost children be found. Do you know how many people that live in Portland? Uh, the, the Portland metropolitan area is 2.4 million people. So many do not know Jesus. God wants to see those people come to know him. Praying for God's concerns mean signals that we're willing to do our part in spreading him to people in our sphere of influence. God's will is that your life and mine shine so brightly with love and purity and kindness and goodness that your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your classmate, your coworker, your friend is drawn irresistibly to Christ because of you. Do you want to have more power in your prayers? Pray for things that will increase God's honor, God's kingdom, and God's will. The third secret to prayer, Jesus tells us, is to be honest with God about every area of our lives. So next, Jesus instructs us to pray. Read this with me. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, Jesus assures us that our personal needs are not unimportant, we're just to pray for his concerns first. But then he wants us to be honest with him about all of our needs. In Jory's introduction, my wife's introduction to her first book, The Power of Modeling, she gives a fun example of being honest with God, just totally honest. And so I thought I would I, I'd read it to you. As the pastor's wife and the mother of four young boys, I find that early mornings are the most action-packed hours of my days. Our two oldest hate to be late for school, often putting pressure on all of us. One morning, it looked as though our carpool driver had forgotten us. If Jeff doesn't come, if Jeff doesn't come in five minutes, I'll take you, I agreed. Our second and fourth graders, jackets zipped and backpacks in position, stood glued to our window, anxiously scanning the streets for our neighbor's car. It's 8.04, I noticed, as I turned to gather shoes and socks for barefooted Luke and to fold a diaper for Joel in case I needed to drive. I quickly dressed and brushed my hair. Only makeup to go, and I'll grab my purse and keys, and the phone interrupted my mental countdown. I answered it amid protest from 10-year-old Tad. Don't, Mom, if you talk, we'll be late for sure. The caller was the acquisitions editor from NAB Press Publisher. I'd been praying for an opportunity to talk to her about my manuscript on parenting. I glanced at the clock, groaning inwardly. If I took the call, my boys would certainly be late for school. On the other hand, I didn't want to miss the opportunity this phone call might provide. I ran to retrieve my manuscript and then to retreat to my bedroom, hurriedly explaining to eight-year-old David to hang up the kitchen phone. Further sensing a need for quiet, I plopped Joel in his downstairs playpen and instructed four-year-old Luke to keep him happy. I bolted past Tad on the stairway, an apologetic look lining my face. His look registered desperation, nearing tears. A fleeting thought reminded me of my prayer for a peaceful conversation with this editor. I had rehearsed the conversation several times in my mind, never anticipating these circumstances. Already I could see I was in for trouble. I wanted to speak clearly. Instead, I grasped, gasped a little breath after nervously chasing up the stairs twice looking for my manuscript. Either David didn't hear me ask him to hang up the phone, or worse, he forgot, because the kitchen phone remained off the hook throughout our conversation. In the middle of our discussion, Tad and David began arguing, oblivious to the phone lying open on the counter next to them. 
All composure gone, they hollered, kicking and wrestling on the floor. Sensing the tension, Joel began screaming from his playpen. Luke seized the, his moment and skipped from room to room, singing loudly, his voice increasing and fading as he rounded his laps. All these sounds projected through the phone, clearly heard by the editor, whom I hoped would publish my book on parenting. <laughs> Not only did I fail to speak well, I could barely think. I felt my opportunity was ruined. I drove my boys to school in silence. Fifteen minutes after the bell rang, I was too upset to pray with them and barely mumbled by. What a disaster. I felt humiliated. Tears stung my hot cheeks as I pondered what right I had to write a book for parents when events like these happened in my own family. <clears throat> I was painfully aware that I am far from a perfect parent. That's what God wants us to do with him, to be totally honest. What right, God, do I have to write a book on parenting when my kids are out of control? God, this is who I am. I'm, I'm just being honest with you, God, and I need your help. Jesus tells us to pray honestly about our needs. He tells us to pray for our daily bread. These are our physical needs. Now, some think it's unthinkable to trouble God with requests for daily bread. But Jesus shows us he wants us to pray about every concern in our lives. Nothing is too small for him to be interested in. Here's the rule. If it's big enough for us to worry about, it's important enough for God to listen to. He wants us to depend on him for everything. Do your requests cover every area in your life? Or do you only pray about the presidential decisions? It shouldn't surprise us that God tells us to pray for our daily bread. Try to imagine what our prayers would be like if we were forbidden to ask for the little things. What if the only things we were allowed to talk to God about were the weighty matters? We would have to exclude God from the bulk of our day because most of our day, right, is, is our, our mundane things. But God does care when we lose our keys, can't find our cell phone, or we desperately need a parking spot or we're going to be late for an appointment, or we wonder if we have enough money to make it to the end of the month. So bring all your needs honestly to God in prayer. And give us today our daily bread. We're told to pray for our physical needs. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're to pray for our moral needs. What does Jesus mean, lead us not into temptation? Does God lead us to temptation? No. James says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. We're tempted by our own evil desires. When we pray this, we're asking God, remove those evil desires from my heart. When we pray, deliver us from the evil one, we admit that there is a kingdom of evil in the world. Why do Christians so often get depressed and discouraged? Why do husbands and wives fight with each other? Why do children inevitably rebel against their parents? Why do so many things in this world seem to be going from bad to worse? Because Satan wants to destroy Christian marriages, families, and the world. We acknowledge that the devil is strong and we need God to deliver us from him. 
We need God's strength to keep us from falling to violence, internet porn, gossip, or whatever. When we pray like this, we're asking God to give us the courage to claim our Christ-given authority to drive out Satan and the spiritual forces of evil. When we pray for God to deliver us from the evil one, we pray to snatch people away from Satan and into Christ's kingdom. When Jory and I worked with high school girl, girls, uh, or high school kids, uh, she worked with the sophomore girls. And so uh, she asked uh, one of the uh, uh, Christian girls in, in the youth group, uh, sophomore, uh, how many girls would you like us to pray for to, to get to go on this retreat? And Marcia said, let's pray for 12. And so they prayed. They talked to girls. They called girls. And just be, as the retreat was beginning, uh, and they, they had a rare moment alone together, Marcia said to Jory, guess, guess how many sophomore girls we have here on the trip? And they counted the sleeping bags. They had 12. They were so excited. God had answered their prayers. God wants us to set goals and to, and to pray for what we believe we can do with his help. Teenager, you can pray for a specific number of kids to come to the youth group. All of us can pray for a specific number of people we want to bring with us Christmas Eve. Finally, Jesus moves from our material needs and our moral needs to praying for our spiritual needs. Read this with me. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You say, are you kidding me? Are you telling me Jesus is not going to forgive me if I don't forgive others? No, I'm not telling you that. I'm simply telling you what Jesus says. Jesus says we can't expect to receive God's forgiveness if we refuse to forgive others. There's a speaker and author maybe you've seen on TV or read her book. Her name is Joyce Meyer. And in her book, Beauty for Ashes, she shares that when she was a very young girl, she was abused sexually by her father. Eventually, it led to rape. And she estimates that her father raped her no less than 200 times before she was 18. She told her mother one day what was going on, and either her mother didn't believe her, or she was afraid of her father because nothing happened. Nothing changed. Well, as soon as Joyce turned 18, she moved out as quick as she could. And she began a process of learning to forgive. She had given her life to Christ when she was nine years old, but she had drifted from that. But then she came back to Christ. And God convicted her that she needed to forgive her father. And so she, one day she came over to see him and she said, Dad, I want you to know that I forgive you for everything you did to me. He showed no compunction. Um, like he hadn't done anything. Though his response really upset her. She knew that she had done the right thing. That God had, you know, con convicted her that she needed to forgive him. You got to understand something about forgiveness. When you forgive somebody, it's not just forgiving them what they did. The main person you're helping is yourself. If you hang on to your bitterness, it will eat you alive. God convicted her not too much time later that she needed to help her parents. And so, parents were living in a not very nice house and they're about 200 miles away, and she talked to her husband, and they, they agreed that they could afford to buy her a house. So they bought her a house about eight miles from their house, and she realized that they needed new furniture too, so they 
furnished it, and they bought him a new car. Well, the parents were very thankful. Dad expressed thankfulness, but, you know, this never talked about what had gone on in the past. And then one Thanksgiving, her mom called her and says, you've got to get over here. Dad's been crying all week. He wants to talk to you. So she and her husband came over and he said, I'm sorry for all that I did to you. And he confessed it. He turned to her husband and he says, thank you for being so good to me. And she could tell that he really was sorry. And she, so she said, Dad, do you want to give your life to Christ? And two weeks later, she baptized him in church. You know, you say, maybe particularly in, in light of what's going on in our culture today, that how could somebody forgive somebody who was that horrible? But you got to remember, that's what God did for us. He forgave us for all the things we've done. You can learn to pray like Jesus. Jesus tells us three secrets to prayer. Praise God. Pray for God's honor, God's kingdom, and God's will. And be honest with God about every, every other area in our lives. Would you take out your, your program, Praying Like Jesus? Inside, there's a, a little three-by-five card. And I'd like to end this way. I'd like you to take this card. I'd like everybody to participate. There are pens under all the seats. On one side, I'd like you to uh, pray for your concerns. This is being honest with God about what's going on in your life. Don't put your name on this. I want you to, we're going to drop this in the, in the offering in just a few minutes. And our prayer team, about a half dozen of us or so, uh, get together every Wednesday and we're going to pray for every one of these cards. Uh, and uh, so on one side, just put your concerns. It can be just one word. You know, marriage, you know, child or job, whatever it is that you're struggling with, you know, a health diagnosis, just, just list them, okay? Then on the other side, I want you to write about God's kingdom concerns. God's kingdom concerns is that all people in this world come to know him. And so maybe on this, you, you put names of people, people in your life. You're pretty sure they don't know Christ or you don't think they're following him. Just list their names. And uh, maybe it's people you're trying to invite uh, Christmas Eve. Might be family members, might be neighbors, co-workers, classmates. I don't know. And then we're just going to drop it in the offering in a little bit, okay? you can finish up let me just close in prayer though father we offer you these things in our card why don't you just hold your card up in the air nobody's going to see it lord these are our heartfelt prayers many things that we're desperate about and we realize you're our father in heaven you love us and you can do something 
So we offer these to you today. As the prayer team prays, we pray your power, your help, the deliverance that only you can give on these needs, these people, we place before you. In Jesus' name, amen.